Anand showed that he was in fine form with a sparkling finish against Halifman. Anand here is white, Halifman black. Now Vish has been attacking on the king side. You can see he's broken through with this pawn on h7. But the pawn actually blocks the attack through to black's king. And Halifman appears to have a strong central pawn formation. This pawn on e5 has just advanced and Halifman is hoping that after perhaps an exchange on e5, queen takes e5, then he'll be able to put some pressure on the pawn on e4. But Anand finds a beautiful idea to keep his attack going. He played his pawn up to f5. Halifman thought, well, all right, that's a pawn, I'll take it. And then came knight to c3. Well, Halifman still didn't realise what Anand was up to. I don't think any of us did, actually. He took another pawn. Why not? Knight takes bishop. Pawn takes knight. And now instead of recapturing the pawn on e4, Vichy played his rook across to g1, and suddenly it all became clear what he was up to. White threatens to play queen to g3, and then queen g8 check. Rook takes queen. Pawn takes rook equals queen. Checkmate. Deadly finish. Amazingly, there's no defense. For instance, queen to f4, then queen h3, and the threat of rook g8 check. Rook takes rook. Pawn takes queen. King takes queen. Queen takes h8, and this cannot be parried. That's it. Checkmate. Likewise, queen f3 allows queen g5, and there's no defense to queen g7. Checkmate. After thinking for some time, Halifman realized there was no defense and simply played his rook up to c5 just to see Anand play out the final moves. There came queen g3, threatening queen g7 mate. Now queen g6, parrying the threat for one move, but then queen h4 was decisive. Rook takes queen on g6 is threatened. And if the queen moves up to f5, then rook g8 check, rook takes rook, pawn takes rook equals queen, king takes queen, and as we saw in the previous variation, queen h8 checkmate. Beautiful finish. The other first round matches saw victories for the powerhouse, Vladimir Kramnik, Mr. Determination, Artur Yusupov, and the timeless Viktor Korchnoi. The unpredictable Vasily Ivanchuk routed Nikolic, and Moscow teenager Alexander Morozevich creamed US champion Boris Gulko. As Alexander said afterwards, thanks for coming, Boris. The highlight of round two was undoubtedly the encounter between Vichy Anand, who will be challenging for the world title later in the year, and Alexander Morozevich, only 17 years old, and already causing quite a stir in the chess world, not only by his results, but by his unique style of play as well. First game he played oh. yesterday, he won excellently, but King's Morozevich Gambit. is pretty good. King's Gambit. Yeah, yeah. Really exciting. Well, that's an interesting choice of opening. This is 19th century chess. Bishop c4. I mean, this was really 19th century stuff. Incredible. I think it's a fantastic choice, and Morozevich is known for playing kind of offbeat stuff, and he does extremely well with it. He prepares well, so this should be interesting. And already he's got Vichy. I mean, Anon is a speed demon at chess. Everybody knows he can play his moves in seconds, and he's already got him thinking on move three. Well, an interesting choice of opening. As you say, Morozevich is known for playing slightly unusual chess. Um, he has a range of quite old-fashioned openings, actually. Um, so this this fits the pattern, and obviously it's going to upset Vichy a little bit. In speed chess, 
it's very hard to counter such offbeat openings. So uh, good, good opening choice, I think. It's a great choice, and certainly now he's gotten a time advantage, very slight certainly, and and Anon is known to be able to whip off moves very quickly, so that's not the problem. But but Anon is going to have to make sure that he doesn't get a bad position because that could be deadly. And Morosevich, he's been in really good form. He devastated Goko in their match, I mean, quite easily. Yeah, I mean, he, he really breezed through the first round against Gulko, made Gulko a tremendously experienced player, made him uh, really look look like a weak player. It's an extraordinary match. It's not easy to do. Gulko is a uh, yeah. US champion. Um, so, and also Morozevich had to qualify to, just to get here, and this qualifying tournament was incredibly strong. So he's already proved himself at speed chess. So this is an interesting match, and not a, a, a difficult match for Anand, I think. Well, the beautiful thing I think about about this match is that Morosevich is showing strength day by day. Looks like he's just getting stronger and stronger. The top players are beginning to respect him as a chess player. He is very creative. He goes his own way. And in this kind of format, as you said, it's ideal, the, the, the weird openings he'll play, because he prepares them so well. Uh, right now, he's only used 15 seconds. When have you ever seen anyone get a two-minute advantage on Anand in the first five or six moves? It's unheard of. And he's done so. He doesn't look as if he has a bad position. Maybe it won't work out uh, against such a strong player. But I think that if he had gone into mainline stuff against now world championship contender uh, Viswanathan Anand, then he'd, he'd probably just get outplayed. That's true. So this is this is an interesting match. Now let's let's take a look at the position. What's been going on here? Well, Morozevich has yet to recapture the pawn that he gambited on the second move, this king's gambit. Um, but he's now threatening to recapture it. The bishop on c1 threatening the pawn on f4. Bishop takes f4. So he's threatening to get the pawn back now. If Anand is to hang on to that, well, he could play something like g5, he could support it with the pawn, but this looks very risky, then h4 would come. I think his, his, he would land himself in even more trouble. So it could well be that Anand just has, has to give back the pawn and just to develop his pieces. There we go, he's played his bishop out to a sensible square to b4, pinning the knight on c3. So sensible development from Anand instead of just trying to hang on to this pawn. I think a, a, a great move in this situation too because it's going to take White a couple of moves to not just capture his pawn back but also to get his king to safety and Anand is preparing now to just simply castle and then his rook will jump onto the e-file giving a pretty nasty check so it seems as if Anand's opening problems may have been solved. This this gambit um, may have gained a, Marusevich a few, few seconds on the clock actually now a few minutes on the clock but maybe not such a great position. I mean, it's it's just very balanced, isn't it? Um, both sides getting out the pieces. One thing that Anand has in his favor here, that bishop, Morozevich's early bishop move out to c4, Anand has countered that. He's blocked the bishop out with the pawn in the center. So that bishop really is, is not on such a fantastic square now. So Anand has simply played very sensibly I mean, there's a great difference between the way that players face the King's Gambit now as opposed to the 19th century. In the 19th century, they would take the pawn, they would try to hang on to the pawn. But this is the modern way. Anand doesn't hang on to the pawn, he returns it straight away and just concentrates on developing his pieces to good squares. Well, the 19th century players would call us wimps for the way we play chess. It seems too much sense in... in positional nuances they this, just wanted to go for the throat this is rational chess this is modern day rationalism yeah and definitely it's better to have the good position than, than have a guy beating at your door because you're hanging on to a scraggly pawn exactly I mean this is practical chess and it's speed chess you've got to be practical so right now Morosevich he gambited in the opening but now it seems as if he's had to slow down his surprise not phasing his experienced opponent, very powerful opponent, who just defeated Gadokomsky in the Canary Islands uh, in the finals of the, of the PCA, to go on to now play against Mr. Kasparov himself, which should be a very exciting match in 
Germany. Okay, so what's what's he gonna do here? What about just let's just play Bishop takes pawn. The problem it seems is that if he just takes the pawn right away, Anand is gonna castle, and the, the natural move for White would be knight of three. But rookie eight check kind of disrupts the whole force. Okay, he so he's got his knight out first, so he's brought his knight out, and so if Black castles, White can bring his king to safety very quickly. So this is a sensible move from Morozevich. Now one day. Is Anand, I know he's castled, I thought he might be contemplating playing a knight into e4, but uh, Anand can play this, this very positionally if he wants to. He can perhaps capture on c3, he can play bishop takes knight on c3 and just break up the pawns. He can leave that for a while, I mean that's, that's an option that's open to him. I mean he, he might just play his bishop out to g4, f5, just knight to c6. He has very free development for his pieces, so this is a pleasant position for Anand, because he has a lot of options open to him. I like the idea of playing the bishop to g4, as a matter of fact, but he has options. Here, Anand made a very committal move. He decided to capture on c3, bishop takes c3. And, naturally, Morozevich recaptured. Now, he's weakened White's queenside pawns, but he's had to give up the bishop to do so, which means his kingside position is going to be a little bit sensitive. Played his queen to c7, not only defending the pawn on f4, but attacking White's pawn on c3. Now, at this point, I thought, well, Anand's got everything under control. It's going to take a little bit of time to Mor for Morozevich to actually capture, recapture his gambited pawn. In the meantime, Anand has pressure on the queen side. He can bring his pieces out, maybe a bishop to f5 and then to e4. Possibly a knight to c6 and then to a5. The position looks fine for black. Morozevich played a good move, queen to e1 defending the pawn on c3 and preparing to swing across to the king side. There came a knight c6, good move. And now queen to h4, preparing to play bishop takes f4, recapturing the pawn. Now I wonder, with the benefit of hindsight, whether Anand perhaps should have played his bishop over to either f5 or g4, and then perhaps brought it back to g6 just to defend his king position. Instead, he played the knight to e7, which also seems okay, preparing to come to g6 or f5. This also opens up the line of black's queen once more down to the pawn on c3. Now, Morozevich could just defend that pawn, but instead he made it into a proper pawn sacrifice, a proper king's gambit. He played bishop takes f4, recapturing his pawn for one moment, but allowing queen takes c3. Then white has to do something about the threat of knight to g6, attacking queen and bishop, so he'll be able to eliminate the dangerous bishop pair. So Morozevich played the bishop back to d2, and the queen came to c7. And now a powerful move, knight to e5, opening up the line of white's rook on f1, down towards the knight on f6. I think already a nasty sacrifice is threatened, rook takes f6, shattering black's king position. Now the knight came to f5, just blocking the f-file and attacking the queen. Now if the queen retreats to, say, f2, then comes knight to e4, and it looks like black is taking over. Very nice position indeed. Instead the queen came to f4. Now bishop e6 to support the pawn on d5. Now bishop to b4, 
to hang the rook on f8, which moved across to c8. White has sacrificed a pawn. Now the question is, does he have enough compensation for it? The bishop on b4 looks very nice, but the other bishop on b3, for the moment, is blocked out by the pawn on d5. The knight on e5 is on a beautiful square. And the rook on f1 has a nice open file. The rook on a1, a little bit out of the game at the moment, but when it reaches e1, then it'll be doing very well. So definite compensation for white, but it seems for the moment as though black's defences are strong enough. In particular, the bishop on e6 is holding everything together, holding the pawn on d5 and supporting the pawn on f7, which is traditionally can be rather weak. Also, the knights on f5 and f6 seem strong enough to me. So what's white to do? Pieces being on light squares and this dark squared bishop having nothing to do. Well, it's normally pretty cool, but... Uh, oh, he's... Not now. <laughs> wow, what a move. He's decided to change the entire tenor of the game. What? What an attack, opening up the king side and attacking with his pawn down the g-line. Okay, so the pawn moves up, attacking the knight. Knight has to move away. Now imagine to the d6 square. He has to be extremely careful. d6 is a target square. That yeah. bishop has Ooh. some nasty possibilities now. That's all that bishop needs is to wake up to some kind of tactic. But the knight has gone there. He's played it. And now... Morisevich must be frantically searching for, look at him, he's looking for some kind of tactical shot that he can use with his bishop and his queen on that same line. If only his knight had somewhere to go that, that would create some kind of havoc. But right now there's nothing concrete to show for this. What can he do? Does he have a possibility then? I mean, a couple of ideas here for White. I mean, that knight on d6, it looks very delicately placed there. Somehow, then there must be a tactic for white, but maybe I mean one idea: just take the knight off and push push the g pawn again. It's just cracky open the f file. I mean that's one idea, but no, that's that seems to Black's defenses seem to hold. Anand just playing so quickly, he's calculated everything. He, he seems I'm sure he'd have spent longer if he if he thought he was in trouble. It's the amazing thing about Anand: the way he just whips off the moves as if he's seen all. And as a matter of fact, if you just keep attacking with the move g5, I know it's just going to put a, that knight on f6 on e4 and batten down the hatches. And it doesn't seem like you can break that position at all. And he's decided not to go for it. He just moved the rook over to the e-line. Well, I mean, Morozevich lashing out with the g-pawn, but later on he might pay for that because his king is now very exposed. I mean, I think he had to do something like this because Anand was starting to gain control. But... Uh, it's, it's still not quite clear how, how Morozevich is going to break through. His pieces are very actively placed, but he's, he hasn't quite cracked Anand's position. It's, it's still not easy. Well, that missing pawn, certainly, if, if he had it, he could use it, but he doesn't, so he's going to have to use his remaining pieces. Uh, right now, Anand, Anand seemed to be consolidating, but every time it looks as if Anand is consolidated, Morisevich comes up with a new idea, and yes, the knight has hopped into e4, and the knight on d6 now feels the heat come off his, his mane as his brethren leaps into the center of the board. Now they are united, locked, and it's very difficult to crack either one, as a matter of fact. And again, Morisevich in a bit of trouble. He's going to have to make sure he, consult, he comes up with more fire, adding more fuel to, to the attack. But he's going to lose this game. He's going to be down that pawn. As a matter of fact, it seems as if Anand is just threatening to play f6, chasing the knight out of the middle of the board, and, and then what do you have to show for the attack? Oh, c4. c4 again. Blowing open the position. Ooh. Superb. Adding more fire, more fuel to the fire. This is, this is fantastic. And again, every time it looks as if Anand has consolidated, tried to prove that there's nothing more. Morosevich has come up with something aggressive, sharp, something. He has to do this or his initiative is going to just dissipate and he's going to lose the game. I think, well, this is a really brave try. If, if the pawn takes the pawn, then the bishop drops back to c2. 
lining up against the knight on e4 and cutting right through the knight down down to black's king so this is very dangerous and anders taken it without much thought but now drop the bishop back hitting the knight in the center of the board on e4 if the knight moves then there's some kind of attack on h7 well i mean this is it's a very brave sacrifice and i, I think morozevich is absolutely right to do this there we go the bishop drops back attacking the knight on e4 and now if you look at the connections all of white's pieces are attacking something all of them connected to something in black's position and this is the kind of position where you feel you smell a combination waiting in the air as if something this is just gonna you just throw a little a spanner into the works and everything just falls apart so right now Anand has to be very careful that his pieces are tied together properly because if that knot is unloosened everything will unravel well I mean this is very complex Anand has a two pawn advantage but he's under tremendous pressure here and what about a move like bishop d5? That bishop seems d5? To... I mean, you can still capture the capture the knight if you want to. And that's one idea. Oh, bishop d5, which knight would you capture? There's so many possibilities. The, the knight in the center of the board on e4. Well, then the, the other knight takes back. No, then, then rook takes. Oh, just, that's the point. Just get two taking. pieces. Get two pieces for the rook. Well, if that's the case, then... Well, Anand's pieces are tenuous. But he, I mean, even that position is, is unclear. I mean, I, th I think it's good for white, but still very unclear. It's a good point, though. Getting two pieces for the rook is a threat. The other idea, I mean, perhaps drop the knight back from e4 to f6 and then into d5. I mean, again, that is, it's very delicately placed. Everything is timing right now. It, it, it works or it doesn't. And... The point, though, that you made about the two pieces of the rook is very interesting, but we have to remember that Anand is now up two pawns. So he might be able to afford to give up some material in order to take advantage of the two-pawn advantage and the fact that the king side is weak, but no, he's decided instead to drop his knight back to f6, and now that knight is threatening to go into the super-powerful square d5. That knight maneuvers into d5, That'll just break the back of the attack. I don't see how Morisavich is going to do anything. He has been ingenious, though, coming up with moves so far. Maybe he might try something like g5 and queen swinging over to h4. That could do something. Absolutely. This, this game, completely unclear. Anand trying to establish some court control in the center. But Morisavich has so many attacking options open to him. He could maybe drop the knight back. That knight on d6 still looking so sensitive. He's playing a brilliant attacking game. Now, let's have a look at the clock times. He has just over eight minutes. And he's played g5 and the possibilities. He's allowed knight d4 and, and now there's some very interesting possibilities. Uh, look oh, at this for me, Danny. Oh, this is, if bis knight, bishop takes h7 check, this is possible. Bishop h7, but there's also the possibility if knight d5 simply playing queen h4 and, and threatened to take on h7. Now, if g6 is played, it's possible that some sacrifices on f7 might pop up. Something like bishop getting rid of the knight on d6, and then maybe just knight takes f7 and sacrificing. So th there's just some, in, just all kinds of stuff happening here. And Anand is going to have to think his way through because Morisavich looks as if he's primed to go for it. There's also, okay, the knight moves to its natural square d5. Bishop takes h7 check, king takes, push the pawn onto g6. Then the queen swings across, the knight comes in. Ooh. I mean, all of white's pieces attacking here, and black's king. I mean, it's. I, th I think he's gone. That's a tremendous sacrifice. I think, I think Anand's going to lose this. This is. This would be amazing. Every time it looked as if Morisavich was out, he's found something new, and now a new threat. Bishop capturing on h7. That could be devastating. This bishop, this is a superb pawn sacrifice that Morozevich has made earlier. That bishop, which we were saying at the start of the game, looked to be locked out of play. He's sacked a pawn and dropped and sacked another pawn and just to get the bishop back into play. And now, if we look at the body language, Morozevich glancing up at Anand. Just Looking very confident. Anand has spent a long time on this move. Not typical, he's been playing at a smooth pace ever since the opening, once he, once he got his bearings, but now he sees the attack. He sees it very clearly, and I feel as if Anand is in some serious trouble. 
Okay, I mean, knight d5 looks like the only sensible move. I don't, I don't see any other. There's knight h5. That's a possibility. You can move the knight the other way. If he moves it to h5, it might be able to block out the queen. Might be necessary, as a matter of fact. That would slow down that attack that we had mentioned. And he's, he's done it. He's done it. He notices the, the attack. Anand is going to defend. He's lowering down. Oh, but this is nasty, too. I mean, it's not a pleasant place for that knight to go to. But it was necessary. Well, there are still so many options open for white. Drag the queen back. The queen is attacked. The queen, just drag it back one square to f3. Attack the knight. Then the pawn comes up to defend and then push in the center. Maybe pawn to d5, is that possible? As a check. Oh, it's, I mean, it's very close. He's brought the queen back to f3. Now, g6 to defend the knight. There you go. The knight has been defended. Now, if d5, there's a check. Ooh. d5 doesn't look no, it doesn't quite, look quite right. right. Okay, because of queen b6 check, and the king's being open in the beginning of the game begins to to have some effect on on possibilities. Also, d5, he could just play bishop f5 and clog up some holes. Well, he has to worry because bishop d6 becomes an option. So right now, right now, Morosevic has to come up with something because Anand is threatening to consolidate again. He's gonna to have to come up with something very concrete because something like knight f5 wants to drop drop into position and plug up some holes. But Anand can't be too happy right now. His knight is misplaced on h5. But how does white get in? I mean, every every time it looks as though Anand is gonna consolidate his position, Morozevich has found a move to break it apart again and keep, keep the attack flowing. But now, his time ticking down. He has round about six and a half minutes left and Anand about 10 minutes. So, pressure is on Morozevich here. He needs a good move. Wow, that knight h5 g6 maneuver is so solid. Just forgetting about aggression and going over onto the defense. Anand is up two pawns and it's up to Morozevich to prove himself. And if he doesn't do something now, it seems as if the last wave of the attack will have spent itself, and he could just lose. And right now, he's he sac has sacrificed his knight. <laughs> oh man, what kind of game is this? He's up the ante again. Oh, this, this is a superb sack. This guy's playing, and now he's he's. He's taking away the defender from the bishop on e6. He might even he might even sacrifice his rook on e6. There's just so many possibilities, and he sensed the moment. He knew it was necessary, and now he's going all the way for it. Yeah, great timing. Now, whether it works is another matter. Okay, take the knight with, with the pawn, but then the line of the rook has been opened up. You can maybe take the bishop, then the bishop takes the knight. Well, White's queen crashes down. Wow, this, this is fantastic. Is, it's just blown open again. This this amazing, amazing sacrifice. As a matter of fact, yes, if you do take with the H pawn, the pawn to the side takes, then rook takes E6, definitely becomes a possibility, followed by bishop takes D6, and everybody will have been removed from the F7 square, then queen F7, and maybe queen takes G6. The whole king side would have been blasted open, but Anand has now recaptured it. And what is Morisevich going to do? He has two sacrifices possible, either on E6 or G6. It's up to him to decide which one will be more effective. Boy, they both look good. He's played bishop takes G6. So now, if pawn takes bishop, then rook takes bishop. So this is looking very nasty. Maybe Anand just has to drop the knight back to g7. I mean, you won't want to do that. This is tremendous play from Morozevich, keeping his attack alive. How are the clock times? Anand, about eight and a half minutes. Morozevich, around about six minutes. This is brilliant play by Morozevich. Fantastic chess. We're, we're definitely having a treat here. Two sacrifice. Well, the pawn sacrifice in the opening in the King's Gambit. Then the second sacrifice to get this awesome bishop into play. And then the third sacrifice with his knight on g6. And now a fourth sacrifice with a bishop on g6. This, this is. They wouldn't call him a wimp in the 19th century. Here, he's playing 19th century chess. They recognize him. It's superb, superb. And there, the sacrifice of the rook for the bishop is looming now because there's still a possibility to break through on the f7 square all of white pieces playing here 
Superb chest from Morozevich, and then glancing up. Now, if ever he needed a good move, it was here. He needs to play so precisely. One false move, and he could just go down instantly. Incredible sacrifices, incredible play, incredible game. And we're, we're definitely being treated to a sparkling chess by the little known Murasevich, but he's coming on his own now. People are starting to know him. I mean, he, he dominated a tournament in your country at nine and a half out of 10 with some ridiculous 2,900 performance rating. Well, he, he won, he won the, the Lloyds Bank Open in London uh, last summer with just tremendous ease. So, I mean, he's really coming, coming through now as a strong player and Anand in big trouble. I think Anand's lost here. I think he's gone. Be astonishing. What a way to upset one of the leading players in the world, arguably a number two player. If the knight comes back to g7, I think you can just play rook takes bishop and then crash through. I mean, I think just so I many don't see defense. possibilities. I know I'm now sweating it out, trying to figure out a move, and I must admit, it looks tough. The knight on h5 is hanging. You can't just give it up. That's, that'll lose for you. He's taken the bishop. Now rook takes bishop, threatening the knight on d6 and rook takes g6 check. Well, rook takes g6 check. At least he can play knight back to g7. So maybe he just needs to move his knight on d6 let that pawn go. After all, he was up two pawns, so the fact that white wins back a few pawns doesn't really mean anything. As a matter of fact, if you check the pawn count, it's still it's still uh, even at the moment, despite the two pawns he's won, and he still is up a piece, so maybe he just needs to make a good knight move. But I, I don't see where the knight can move to. But, but where to is a really good question. Knight f5, for example, rook g6 just rips off one of the pawns, and it rips off the pawn and then the knights have lost their footing. So, but I mean, just look at Anand's king. How many pieces does it have around it? Well, the queen can come across, maybe the knight, but every single one of Morozevich's pieces on the attack, the bishop, the rook, both rooks, the queen. I mean, it, it looks like too much for me. I think Anand's in big trouble. I think the champion from last year in Moscow is in big trouble here. Morozevich could cause the first great upset of this tournament. It definitely looks bad. He can't even play knight f7 because of rook g6 check. And after knight g7, queen f6 penetrates. Moves, good moves look scarce. Good moves look easy for Morozevich to find. Difficult for Anand. Morozevich's attack is just flowing beautifully here. And now Anand is, has less time than his opponent. He has just four and a half minutes left. A sure sign that he's in trouble. He needs to find the best move here. But it might, even that might not be good enough. I think he's lost. Is it possible for him to play rook f8 in this position? Rook f8, queen d5. Ooh, this, this could just be ugly. Rook f8. Well, maybe. Rook f8, queen d5, and rook takes rook takes f1 check, and then queen f7 check might be something. Maybe rook f8 is a thought, just giving back. Well, you know, if, if rook f8, I think there's a really nasty tactic. You play rook takes g6 check, Ooh, knight g7, yes, and, and then queen, queen takes f8. f8. Yeah, that could well, be something. Well, all of black's pieces just lined up very neatly to be taken in that variation. I mean... Anand can try so many things here, but there's always a tactic that's, that just upsets him. I don't see he has a defense. He's things looking look very hard. bad, and he's now down to three and a half minutes, and he's finally played queen to f7, which gives back, which gives up more, well, gives back the piece and, and keeps, well, even that's not clear. Maybe, maybe something like queen d5 can be played. So what, what is he going to do about queen d5? What Anand is trying to do here is seek some relief in the end game. He's trying to desperately exchange queens, but Morozevich having none of it. 
He keeps the queens on the board, moving the queen to the center, and now the rook on f1 has been opened up, attacking black's queen. And this looks devastating. Oh, that's the end, he has to play. He has to play knight f5 now and allow rook takes g6, check. And then he drops the other knight back to g7, and but then he's just going to simply lose his one of the knight, the other knight. The knight on f5 is going to be pinned. Uh, the knight on g7 is going to be pinned, so Morisevich could just could just capture it, but at least this is just giving away a pawn and hoping to slow down the attack. This is the kind of chess he needs to play because he's he's in deep trouble. I think Anand, he's found a reason. Like, Whoa! Rook takes F5. Oh, that's the end, surely. Oh, a tremendous response. What a sacrifice. And now pawn takes is answered by G6. Oh, we. Boy, what an answer side! That's it! Oh, what a blowout, a fantastic sacrificial 19th century performance by young Morisevich. Incredible game. Let's return to the start of Morisevich's cascade of sacrifices. This was the move, pawn c4, that shook Anand's position to its foundations. It seems as though the knight on e4 is securely defended, and that's really holding black's position together. It's blocking out all of white's pieces. But the move c4, it undermines the knight's support, this pawn on d5. And also, it brings the bishop on b3, which was locked out of the game, it brings it right into the attack. Anand took the pawn on c4, and the bishop retreated to c2, attacking the knight on e4, which must now retreat. It dropped back to the only square, f6, but Morozevich continued his initiative by moving the pawn up to g5. The most natural move for black's play here is to play knight to d5, nice central square, attacking the queen and the bishop. Well, positionally, fine. Tactically, it loses. Watch this. Bishop takes h7, check. And if king takes bishop, then g6, check. There are two possible moves to black. One is to bring the king back to g8. But then comes queen to h4. If pawn takes pawn, then knight takes g6, queen h8 mate is threatened, and there's really no satisfactory defense for black. For instance, if knight to f6, then simply rook takes e6 can be played. If instead black defends the check on h7, by playing the knight back to f6, then comes rook takes f6. And after pawn takes rook, queen h7 check, king f8, and now if g7 check, the king run, runs to e7, but the clearest win is knight takes f7. If, for instance, bishop takes f7, then g7 is checkmate. Returning to the position after g6 check, black can just take the pawn, but then queen h4 check, king g8, knight takes g6, transposes to one of the positions we were looking at earlier. White has a winning attack. That was the reason why Anand was forced to play the knights to h5 rather than natural central square d5. Marzevich retreated the queen to f3, attacking the knight, which forced pawn up to g6. And now Marzevich crashed through anyway with knight takes g6. It's a lovely series of sacrifices. Pawn takes knight. And then came the next sacrifice, bishop takes pawn. Pawn takes bishop. And now rook takes e6. There's really no defence for Anand. He played his queen across to f7, hoping to simplify down into an endgame. But naturally, Morozevich was having none of it. 
played the queen to d5. So the queen now attacked on f7. If it moves, then there'll be a decisive discover check by the rook on e6. So Anant had to block knight to f5. And now the sit it looks like the simple move is rook takes g6 check. Of course the rook can't be taken because of the queen on d5 pointing down to the king on g8. But then there's a chance that Anand would be able to defend by moving the knight back to g7. But Vichy's dreams were shattered by rook takes f5. And now if queen takes f5, then rook takes g6 check, double discovered check I should say, wins black's queen. If king to h7, then queen takes f5. And if pawn takes rook, then g6 wins. If queen g7, then rook e8 is double discovered checkmate. And if queen takes rook, then queen takes queen, check, king g7, and now black's king is simply too exposed to be able to survive. There are many ways to win this position, but perhaps the simplest is queen f7, check, king h6, queen h7, check, king g5, bishop e7, check, king g4, trying to hang on to the knight, but h3 check decides. The knight on h5 drops, and then it's simple.